Hello, friends and fellow video gamers. Right. Right. <laughs> I didn't want to completely copy Andrew. <laughs> um, and welcome to the fourth Let's Talk of the penultimate episode of The Walking Dead. Again, my apologies for getting this video out so late, but I busy life things. And the fifth and final episode of, as of this recording, the finale episode of The Walking Dead is coming out tomorrow. So I wanted to get this in as quickly as possible um, so that we can talk about the finale without worrying about uh, sp spoilers or anything. So um, I am here once again with Mark, Jacob, and Andrew as we will dive in, dissect, analyze as much as we'd like the fourth episode. Um, and uh, this episode opens up with Yet another flashback. I feel like virtually every single episode of the series starts with a flashback. Mm -hmm. um, that takes place between David and Javier at the batting cages, I guess is what they call it. What do you guys think was the purpose? What was the purpose of this flashback, do you think? To show some brotherly bond slash hostility between Javi and David. Which we have seen in the past. So do you think that this necessarily gave us anything new? Or I, not I, really? Well, I was going to say that I think because um, like towards the end of that flashback, um, you know, Dave was, was talking about, you know, his, uh, his uh, marriage was crumbling and how he's like unhappy and that he wants to go back to the military. So I think that explains like why like Javier and Kate started getting a bit closer. So if okay. anything, explain more about more than um, Javier and David's relationship, more than uh, more for more so for um, Javier and Kate's relationship. So you, Mark, didn't think that this scene was was redundant. You thought it did add more to the story. A little bit. I mean, it could have been more fleshed out, but a little bit. Yes, I would say so. If you make the right dialogue options after the flashback ends, you can have Javi ask David, remember when you were thinking about going back to the recruitment's office and David just bluntly says, uh, but you talked me out of it. So uh, I really don't really understand the significance of the choice if if Javi talks David out of it anyways hmm. on screen. Although David did buy me a beer at the end of that flashback, so I guess I role-played it correctly. <laughs> correctly, <laughs> yes. Ends its beer. I... I think you already had enough justification to if by this point you needed to like David or not like David or feel OK moving ahead with because they set us up at the the end uh, about Kate's feelings and, and acting on them or not. Mm -hmm. I think this may have been, well, here's a few more pieces that you can have to justify that. But I think you already figured that out by this point, whether your mm -hmm. hobby is. And I, I have a bone to pick with that later on because that I think that was so, really handled. But yeah, yeah. So, Andrew, do you think that this this splashback was necessary, or do you think it could have we could have done without it? Eh. I think we, I think we had enough already to know that Javi is David thinks Javi is a flake, and that Javi is disgraced baseball. We already kind of knew all the facts, and other than that little girl who got i think it was a girl who got i i, I couldn't tell honestly yeah, <laughs> it was like was it a girl or a boy well, I mean, I got him to sign the ball the same voice actress as ava so ah uh, okay uh that's that would end up like somehow in uh, richmond's <laughs> she throws the ball and hits joan in the head and like remember <laughs> me like that was the only thing that i'm like is this gonna play out later but no i, I didn't like, it wasn't vital I, I like that. I think that would have been hilarious if that's what they ended up doing. That's they great. Did the little <laughs> note thing, like, remember, we'll remember this. I, yeah, yeah. I guess they fake out now. And, of course, my baseball would have said not for resale because I made it worthless. <laughs> oh, I see. I, so maybe they... – go ahead. I was going to say, I will say that whole scene signing the autograph was pretty amusing. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I got a little chuckle out of that as well. Yeah. Um, uh, that that was probably my favorite part of that entire flashback was just the scene with the kid uh, of of androg androgynous gender, I guess. Um, so then we move on to present time 
For me, David and Javier get put into, I guess, the holding room, not cell, but holding room. Is that the same for everybody? Like, because I know that for me, we ended up not having what's his name with us to be a witness. Max. Max. We didn't have Max with us. So does that that does that still happen? Play out that you guys are locked up even if you did have Max with you? Yes. Max, Max isn't in this episode if you keep him alive. Okay. So, but yeah. he is. A, but he is a corpse if you kill him. Okay. And letting uh, Mac, uh, killing Max also gets Lonnie killed, but keeping Max alive lets Lonnie live. So I thought that was interesting. Oh, I had no idea. Okay. Plus, we also get a cameo from that driver from episode one. What if you, yes. if you let him go, Rufus? Yes. Yeah, you can ask yes. him for help, and he's all like, "I'm helping you by not shooting you." Right. Thank right. you. <laughs> I, I think. Thank you for the positive consequence of my choice. I guess. Oh, yeah. But depending on who side you who you sided with in the previous episode, David will be friendly towards you or just hate you. And if you make the right dialogue option, he'll say your betrayal wasn't as bad. Jones' betrayal wasn't as bad as yours, little brother. Yeah, I I did kind of like that you can be rewarded, if you want to call it rewarded, to end up making up with David. I actually got, or I guess earned, the hug with him in my playthrough. Um, and I, I like that, but at the same time, I still, even to this day, I'm not really sure... In that moment, uh, not even talking about what happens at the end, but in that moment, I wasn't even sure how I felt about David, really. <laughs> I wasn't sure if I necessarily hated him and didn't want really anything to do with him or if I actually was trying to establish some sort of brother brotherly relationship with him still. Uh, what, did you, how, what are you guys' takes on David, at least by that point? in the story well well here's what what i think um even if you feel uneasy about david or whatever like w w um when i'm playing these games i i try not to burn bridges i try to make as many yeah. allies as i can you know and even if it's un an uneasy alliance so so i tried to play nice with david because i didn't want to burn bridges with him because I, because he could have been a valuable asset and he was my brother. So that just made sense to me. So that's the way I saw it. Keep your friends close and keep possible enemies closer. Yes. <laughs> keep possible. Okay. Andrew or Jacob. I feel like David is this season's uh, Kenny. Because ah. In season one, they did do a thing where, Depending on how you play, you can either have Kenny be neutral towards Lee, be Lee's best friend, or have Kenny just outright hate Lee. And even mm -hmm. though I think Kenny, or uh, season one Kenny, is still a better character than David, I feel like the execution on how you get David to like you or hate you is executed just slightly better than Kenny. Because hmm. the way Kenny was angry at you if you sided with him for every single thing in season one except helping him kill Larry and he still hates you is really dumb to me. Because it's like... He's, totally agree. Yeah, he's more angry at Lee for not helping him murder him than he is at Larry for... <laughs> sure. Okay. That, that's, that's a good point. That's a very valid point. Uh, Andrew, thoughts on David? At that point <laughs> yeah he's i don't know i keep coming back to well part of this this game for this session and particularly like uh very more the, the nuance had kind of faded a little bit for some of the main characters for me that they either behaved in a very black and white like stark contrast their their choices and their behaviors or and or they were Kind of going against something that i had kind of built up like a trajectory for their character for how i was playing them like the the options seemed to be taken away in a few moments one of those things was definitely with david and javier and their interaction to each other like i had thought you know he just feels like a little david a little too of a binary character because as we see by the end it's you know hey i'm here and we're tr i'm trying to to do things better by you and do right and he's just so angry i guess it's kind of like he's the same as he was always. And I guess people are like that, but mm -hmm. in a game where your choices matter, I, and that we have a flashback with them again, and that, that 
relationships really central. The fact that it seems like you can do nothing to change David being a brash, headstrong, just rush and not, you know, neglect his situation. I don't know, it's a bit disappointing. Yeah, I agree with you there as well. Uh, after that conversation, then you get rescued, uh, depending on your choices, by Kate or Gabe. Uh, Gabe rescued me because I ended up, I he, guess, siding with him. Yeah, because you uh, yeah. chose to go to David's house, Gabe rescues yeah. you. Or if you try to escape, Kate rescues you. Yeah. I was rescued by Gabe. Okay. Um, and I don't know if anything majorly significant happens differently with Kate versus Gabe before you get back to, I guess, the apartment where the rest of the group has been gathered. I do like that um, subtle difference, though, that something that you wouldn't even know is a branching path unless you played it a second time. Oh, yeah. Kate or Gabe can rescue you. Yeah. Yeah. Even if it if it doesn't have any major differences or consequences, like little details that change in your story. I do. I do appreciate. Um, and then when you get back to the get back with everybody else. You've got the scene with the brief scene of Trip and Eleanor. They're trying to figure out, you know, where they stand. Um, and uh, then they try to decide on how to make their make next move. Uh, Conrad is still there, if you kept him alive. Twice. Uh, kept him twice. alive twice. Um, I did want to pause a little bit and talk about Conrad's character, because I think that they did Conrad's character exceptionally well in this season for someone who is a determinant character, especially for someone who has had so many determinant deaths throughout this entire season, including this episode. Um, because in the past, I find that if a character could have died in one episode, they end up just being furniture in the next episode. Like they're there, but you don't really hear them speak at all. Or it's as if the writers just give up on really doing anything with their character because they could have died by this point. So why bother giving them something else, God forbid, to do in the following episodes? I think so, that's mostly just season two, not so much season one. Because we really only had like that's three. That's true. We only had like three determinate characters in season yeah. one, Doug, Carly, and Ben. True. And Ben was the closest one we got to a double determinate character before Conrad. Yeah. Because you could save him, but then you could also choose to leave him behind or bring him with you to yeah. Clementine. Nick Nick was a major character that I think several of us had a complaint about that, where he he could have died in one episode, and then you don't really hear I mean, from him or have anything have him doing anything again until he dies a second time or has another determination. I wouldn't have minded his off-screen death had, had um, he rescued him meant something. Because yeah. he does live through episode three, regardless of your choices, if you kept him alive in episode two, unlike Conrad, where you have to keep him alive continuously in each episode to keep him going. Yeah, but the but the point is, he still feels like a well-fleshed character who was supposed to have been there in the story all along, as opposed to just brushed aside. Other, Do you guys have other Plus, thoughts on like Conrad? Plus, when you get to kill Badger in the episode three, the, the little let Conrad do it option was pretty cool. Yes. Yes. Uh, uh, he's been dead in my story since the very beginning of the opportunity for that to happen, so I haven't gotten to know him at all. Mm -hmm. uh, didn't enjoy the trip. Well, I guess if, if you don't have him, then Trip gets super mad at you. I mean, he kicks you out, doesn't go along with the plan. Uh Again, people's reactions seem a little too too jerky. We have to decide this immediately. We can't talk, you know, mm -hmm. like everything's, we have to decide if we love each other right now or not. And there's no nuance between, you know, Kate and Javier at all. Like, we'll, we'll get to that. But yeah, uh, I have nothing on Conrad. <laughs> I don't know. So you're saying it feels, <laughs> well, with Trip, you're saying he's it, it feels, and characters like Trip, it feels inorganic or it doesn't feel natural them to react the way that they're reacting is that is that what you're saying andrew yeah well, you'd been you'd gone through a bunch of stuff with him and you'd saved him a few times and like well yeah there was this good reason why i had to kill conrad i mean he he was nuts he's gonna kill the kids he totally yeah. flipped out and drip's like 
I can't believe you did that. I'm just get out. We're and like, mm-hmm. really? We just been through all this stuff, and you're not willing to at least yeah. consider that I might have like justified. Yeah. But no, no, nothing. Yeah. The the only reason why I know about all the Conrad stuff is because my my game bugged out twice on two separate let's plays. When I tried to play episode three, it bugged out where it it completely, like my my save for. For, for up to that point it was completely gone it was completely completely gone so i had to replay episode well no i ended up deciding to just have it randomly generate my decisions in episode three and it just so happened that virtually virtually all of my choices seem to still line up and then going into episode four i checked to make sure that my save was still there and then i played episode four and none of my choices were matching up. So I actually had to replay episode three during my live stream so that I could catch up and play episode four. But the time I played replayed episode three, Conrad was alive magically. So I started experiencing all of this interesting Conrad stuff that I didn't experience before because he's suddenly alive all of a sudden. Um, but uh, but I don't know. I, I think that that inadvertently is the only reason why I know about all of the Conrad things that's been going on. Uh, yeah, I had to do a second playthrough to get the Conrad stuff too because I killed him originally mm-hmm. as well. And I had a different mindset because when uh, Gabe throws Javi under the bus and um, lets out that uh, Javi killed Conrad, in my mind when Javi said the line, uh, uh, we can't let you be a mortar, Gabe. Your life is too precious. I'm just thinking, says the guy who shot Conrad, I know I made that choice, but I was still thinking it. And then when Gabe threw it out there, I'm like, um, thank you. It's a contradiction much, Javi. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And plus, I uh, kind of understood that Dude Trip's reaction because when you came out of the tunnel, you looked him in the eyes and just said, oh, um, we left him behind. And then that was like the end of it. You didn't really tell him that you personally shot him. So he kind of felt like you were keeping it from him. And I'm like, if I found out someone I'd been spending time with killed my friend a few days ago and only told me that we were forced to leave him behind, I'd probably react similarly. Fair enough. Fair enough. It was After Eleanor the... that I had a problem with in this episode. Why did you have a Why did you have a problem with Eleanor? Because she ratted on us. Even if you don't shoot Conrad, she still rats on you. Were you, Were you about to say something, Andrew? No, I'm I'm agreeing. Yeah, it it felt like a lot of this stuff just I don't know I. I... And maybe it's just because my past experience with both seasons one and two were playing them start to finish. So I might like be forgetting these important connections because there's a month between ep- each episode mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. of just uh, uh, just like he was uh, saying about, you know, I would have remembered that tunnel thing. So the scene would have felt more mm-hmm. organic and realistic. But I just felt this this whole kind of thing was pretty disjointed. And I laughed out loud when. Uh, when we, in a, in a, like a moment like really that's what you said in that moment you just said the opposite thing like it was just <laughs> really off putting uh, gotcha I'll share that later uh, after that scene you and Gabe I think it's always Gabe um, go on a little mission together um, you, you either run bring in... Ava with you or run into Ava there depending on if you went ah. to David's house okay um you get a little bit of a run in with one of the henchmen, I guess. Gabe tries to help. Uh, it doesn't necessarily go the way it was planned. Um, and then eventually, uh, eventually Javier finds Clementine. After he gets stabbed. After he gets stabbed. And they have the Clementine is growing up talk. Um, and I actually paused for a good five minutes at least talking about that one scene about clementine talking to um javier about the a a very very everyday thing that i'm sure every single girl can relate to which is completely completely has nothing to do with the zombie apocalypse or what's happening but but it was just interesting that they included that little conversation um and and my my big I guess discussion over the topic was just how I how I guess it interesting I find that many people 
find that conversation to be very awkward and maybe not necessarily off-putting, but difficult to navigate around, especially if you happen to be a male gamer playing this game. Um, I'm not sure if you guys felt the same way. I mean, Andrew has a daughter, and granted, I don't think Charisma's and him are going to be having that talk anytime soon, but, but uh, I had zero issue with it. I had zero, like, um, anxiety or, you know, awkwardness having this talk with, with Clementine. I don't know how you guys felt. <clears throat> well, I'm a 19-year-old socially awkward introvert. I'm just awkward around people in general, so. <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, I didn't. I didn't have a problem with the conversation. I felt it had some connection to like. There's a line that she has been, or Clem has been AJ's mom in a way, and now this is part of it. And mm-hmm. so I guess in it was some indication of why they might have feelings and Twitter pated stuff. But I, while I didn't have any kind of awkwardness with it, I maybe I'm projecting, maybe just as, as I guess we're all going to do in these games. Uh, it felt a little uh, trying to appeal to, hey, you know, we included a thing on periods. Look how sensitive we are to women's issues. Kind of a th- not not enough to make me stand and like yell at it for that. But I just got a little vibe of it felt a little easy for her to kind of, I don't know. Maybe I can't. I'll, I'll, I'll kind of try and reorient my thoughts on it. But uh, well, you get what I'm saying? Maybe a little bit. Yeah. I, I mean, did you think that? If I'm understanding what you're saying, are you saying that you thought that it might have been a little soapboxy? That there might have been some sort of agenda behind it? Yeah. Well, the I, yeah, I think maybe a little bit. Not like you shouldn't send a soapbox on gamers are awkward around period talk or whatever. But like. Mm-hmm. In order to make us, you know, and I, I don't want to say it in, in full, like it is absolutely yeah. this way, but just a little inkling of uh, the writers of the game saying, you know, we would we, we would be like, you know, more sensitive to female gamers if we put in some something like this, rather than it saying. being a normal, reasonable thing, which it is in some ways. I don't know. They just felt a little little tinge of that. But I just could just be me on that. It it could be possible that that was one of the reasoning behind including that scene. I I felt that the purpose of the scene was was two things. One, um, trying to put some sort of relatable thing that, as I said, has nothing to do with the story that could have been removed completely and it would have still been fine. But just something relatable, just to try to anchor what's going on to something that. Um, is familiar, I guess. And B, I thought the other purpose was to try to establish that Clementine sort of sees Javier as as an older brother or sort of like family in that she can have these personal conversations or felt comfortable enough to open up about these personal things with him. So I thought I thought those were that was the purpose. Um, but maybe you have maybe you're onto something as well that I just didn't see myself. Um, I thought it was natural because if you look at Clementine's past, she was eight when the zombie apocalypse happened, and both of her mm-hmm. parents were dead. So it's like no one was around to teach her about this stuff, and mm-hmm. her only adult uh, f- uh, figure, parental figure in season one, was Lee, and I don't think he wanted to talk to her when she was eight years old about this. And then although she had three parental figures in season two want to carry over from season one with Kenny and then Luke and Jane as newcomers. I don't really think they talked to her about this stuff either. So she probably just had no idea what it was. Mm-hmm. Andrew, I wanted to ask you as a, as a GM, um, when you're establishing your stories, when you're establishing scenes, and if you introduce a scene in your campaign that has nothing to do with the overarching story because i do it as well like sometimes i'll have a character start a conversation an npc starting a conversation with a main character about some sort of topic that is disjointed from the overarching story um 
a lot of times players ask me, you know, what was the purpose of that? Not not as a as a you know why the heck did you add that in, but more like I'm just curious what was the reasoning behind having that character talk about this. Do you find yourself doing that yourself, maybe even subconsciously having your, a character or introducing some sort of element into a scene that is unrelated to the overarching story, but maybe there is a specific purpose behind it? Oh, for sure. Uh, and maybe it's a little hypocritical to point it out in this, uh, but again, I don't think the scene was unnecessary in, in its entirety. If the scene serves to, I mean, what is the point of the game? It's not just to tell a story, but it's to tell a story with characters that we care about. And if the mm -hmm. scene serves mm -hmm. the purpose of get, helping us to care about the characters more, mm -hmm. how do we care about the characters more? Mostly by knowing more about them. The more you know, mm -hmm. the more you, you know, mm -hmm. love or hate, right? Kind of a thing. Mm -hmm. Uh, so there's usually not a, a big problem for me in introducing those things. In fact, I like them almost will be intentionally putting them in, not as if they would contribute to the story, but it will contribute to the deepening of their character uh, morality sort of difficulties. The story right. is go through the goblins' minds and stop them from their mega machine. But in the goblin okay. mine, there's a, a, a woman that they captured and... Mm -hmm. She's in a difficult predicament. How do you handle that? It's related to the story. It's, mm -hmm. and it allows us to know our characters more, but you want to make sure that you're including it. Not mm -hmm. uh, there's a magical ice cream salesman in the middle of the, the, the dungeon. <laughs> and I want to know about what's your favorite flavor of ice cream. Okay. What's your back? What's your backstory <laughs> about? Uh, yeah. So it needs to feel organic. It should still be connected to what's going on. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I don't know that we need to need it necessarily to have, I mean, we get that Javi's already parental. He's already doing it with the other two. So we don't mm -hmm. learn that about him. Mm -hmm. uh, the other two kids, well, one now, I guess. Uh, and then we already know that Clementine is growing up. Like we're seeing yeah. her, she's maturing. She's making more difficult decisions. Mm -hmm. We don't need any justification for her um, motherly instincts because we've already seen her taking care of AJ and, and those kind of things. I don't think it gives us anything extra to understanding our characters. I think it's already been established. And that's that was my inclination as to why it might have been there. Uh, felt a little like we didn't need this, not because it's icky, but because we already know all this stuff about these characters. We don't need to know facts about the characters, right? Yeah. doesn't help us to know oh she's ovulating and you know like that doesn't help us understand who the character is in any way i didn't think it was necessary and i also laughed out loud um mm -hmm. when he's where you're searching around for stuff and he opens the thing he describes this bottle of pills he opens this thing it's the the pain meds yeah and you have to make a choice to take it or not and then there's a bottle of pills next to the monitor and he looks at it and he's like Mm, those are just pills. It, like, it, like it just moves on. I'm like what? We just heard you whine about two other things. They're like, oh well, it doesn't matter what those are. That that was yeah, really off. -putting. Maybe they but, weren't specifically painkillers. <laughs> I feel like when yeah, I feel like when you're in apocalypse, you can, if there's like medicine or any right? kind of. You, you grab them. It doesn't matter what they are. You might need them for What's something. What's the just pills going to be sitting around there like? <laughs> right. These are the just pills for <laughs> osteoporosis. That's what I was like, <laughs> really? You kept those? You're salvaging those? And that was just know. weird. That is very, yeah, you have a good point. Um, I think I think that uh, we're at a disadvantage since all of all four of us are happen to be guys. So I am curious if anybody who's watching who happens to be female, if they wish to comment and chime in about their thoughts on this particular scene. Did they feel, did any of the female audience members, did they appreciate that scene? Did they feel like the scene was pandering, I guess, to the, the girl player, the female players? I, I don't know. Um, so I, I'm just curious for anyone who wants to share their thoughts or perspective on that. Uh, okay, so after that, um, we then come to either a flashback or multiple flashbacks. Um, if you ended up with either Jane or Kenny, then you got an extra flashback with them. 
And then if you didn't, then you kind of were SOL like I was and didn't get that extra content. Well, before we talk about the aspect of whether we did or we didn't get extra content, um, Jacob, since you were one of the people who had Kenny, do you want to give a very brief summary of what happens in the flashback? And I'll put a link at the bottom so you can see the flashbacks for yourself if you have not seen them. When you go back to season two and you have that last choice between enter Wellington or leave with Kenny, knowing that it, uh, choosing to leave with Kenny would make the episode four and season three run times about five minutes longer, would you yeah. re redo that choice now? Are you asking me that? <laughs> I'm just joking. Oh, oh. So the Kenny flashback, it takes place about a month before the flashback that we saw in episode one. Mm -hmm. And basically the flashback starts with Clementine playing fl uh, shadow puppets with AJ. And uh, after you save AJ from a walker, um, Kenny just starts talking about family mm -hmm. and just past events from the uh, season two, like saying... Uh, Sarita always said, "Family is what you make of it. Not necessarily. You don't necessarily have to be blood related." And what I did to Carver, I did to you. Yada yada yada. And then you got like at the end of the the, the last uh, dialogue option you can pick is basically just exclusive to big Kenny fans because your options are hug Kenny, we love you, don't be sorry, <laughs> your family. So, so big Kenny uh, fans would be, uh, would appreciate the this flashback, I imagine. Uh, for for those uh, for those of you who have seen this flashback, have you seen this flashback, Mark? I have. Yes. You have, and I don't know if Andrew, okay, Andrew probably hasn't seen them yet. Um, do either of you have any thoughts, opinions, reactions to the Kenny flashback? I really liked it. I think it adds mm -hmm. a lot because based because another thing a, a difference with the Jane flashback when you get to the Ava portion. Flashback just says one. Jane one says thirteen months later. So it goes to show how much time Clementine spent with Kenny after season two compared to a uh, Jane. Mm -hmm. I I also liked it too. I thought it was very sweet. Um, I thought that if you are a Kenny fan, then um, it was a really great way to continue uh, exploring what his relationship with Clementine was while they were out together. Um, they do definitely, I, I always refer to Cle Kenny as not necessarily Clementine's father figure because Lee was Clementine's father figure. I always saw Kenny as as um, Clementine's uncle figure, her <laughs> like favorite uncle or the, or the uncle that she ends up with figure. A bipolar um, uncle. A bipolar uncle. So, um, and I, I got to see that. So I thought that was, that was a really cool thing. Uh, Mark... You, you've seen the uh, Jane flashback. Do you want to give a brief uh, summary of that? Sure. Um, I, and if, uh, if I miss some details because it's been a while, um, please someone correct me. So if I remember, mm -hmm. I think at the be beginning, um, Jane and Clementine with baby AJ, um, mm -hmm. they're, get they're getting rid of like all the corpses from house. They're going to dump them into like a, a ditch. Mm -hmm. which they do which also has carver's corpse in there yes <laughs> and carver's the, is there mm -hmm. and and um jane makes a comment you know it's like you know carver was a monster but kenny was also a monster for doing that and then as clementine you have the choice to say you know we're no better or it's like kenny was a monster so depending on how you felt about kenny you can make a a mm -hmm. choice with that and then um and then wa walkers come because they always do <laughs> And, and I think Clementine falls into the ditch, and then you have to fight your way out. But but um, Jane has has a baby AJ, so there's not really much she can do. And then um, and then uh, she <laughs> Clementine gets out of, out of the ditch, fighting the Walkers, and then they have a conversation. And um, that's that's really all I remember. If there if there was more, I, I forgot. Please please elaborate. But then you go mm -hmm. to the Ava flashback, so. No, that was basically it. I have some issues with the Jane flashback. Like, if the wiki has um, some information, like, some of your choices in Season 2, not just the ending, also impact the flashback. Like, Jane will bring up whether or not you watched Kenny murder Carver, or whether or not um, the baby will puke on her again if you made her hold it in the finale. I remember. That's that's a yeah. cool, that's a neat thing. But I thought it was disappointing how this ep this flashback takes place before the Episode 1 flashback, yet... You don't see the family. 
if you let the mm. family in. I, mm. I guess they're just back at house and you're just doing this by yourselves. Mm -hmm. And plus, I thought it was odd how, despite the fact that Carver's corpse was among the ones that you threw into the pile, uh, if you didn't get Alvin killed back in the ski lodge, his corpse wasn't among the ones in the wheelbarrow. At least I didn't see him in the pile, mm. which is either, we which you think you would because he was a big dude. Um, weird maybe things they, like that. Maybe they buried... I mean, Albert, since Albert was one of one of them, maybe they decided they wanted to bury him instead of dumping him into a big giant communal ditch, I guess. Yeah, I guess. I don't think I would want to throw him in a communal ditch, personally. Um, especially since, well, I was going to say he's the, 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 the father of AJ, but not really the father of AJ. Oh, um, I mean, AJ's not white, so there's no way Carver can be the ki the father. Um, other thoughts on the Jane flashback before we move on? Okay. And then if you didn't have Kenny or Jane, then the only flashback you got was the Ava flashback that everybody got. Before I give my opinions or thoughts on that, anybody wants to react to that <laughs> at all? <laughs> Five minutes of content that we don't get. That means the choice. <laughs> towards the end of the episode a lot harder. Do you, well, do you think that that was necessarily a good or bad thing? Because the argument could be made, well, we're being punished because, you know, we made the decision that ultimately led us to having five minutes less of, a, of content. No, uh, and... I mean, like, no, the Ava of, of flashback made the choice of Trip or Ava much harder. Well, well, uh, what I was saying is, is, is do people feel like it's necessarily good or bad that that players get less content based on their decisions, or do you think that that actually is okay because then it actually means that our choices have actual consequences, and some of those consequences can include we don't get a five-minute flashback like other people do? I think that's where the alone ending could have come into play, your consequence of not having anyone with you at the end. You just don't get five minutes extra content, but you spent two years growing up with AJ in Wellington. You, you could have gotten a little flashback of what was life in the community there and give yeah. Edith some more character. Mm -hmm. How about you, Mark or Andrew? But Mark, you want to answer that question? Sure. Do you, think it was, do you think it's good or bad? Do you think we should try to make it equal for everybody? No matter what choice you get, you should get some some five minute content or no because then your choices don't matter as much if you just make it equal for everybody see here's the thing that that's a very very good question and a very complicated and multifaceted question because um because it's like even going back um i don't mean to get off topic a little bit here but it's like going back to like say mass effect 3 you know all those years ago okay. it's like there were certain choices like for example if you saved the Rachni Queen, or you killed the Rachni Queen, the Rachni still appear in Mass Effect 3 anyway, so you're not being locked out of content. So it, so it's a very interesting question. It's like, should you be locked out of content um, for choices that you made? And um, so, and uh, you know, I don't have the answer to that, but what I do know is um, I pretty much agree with Jacob that um, if you do have the alone ending, um, okay, that makes sense that you wouldn't get that extra content, but for people who had the Wellington ending, which you know was was you know really fleshed out with along with along with the Kenny and Jane endings, um, we should have gotten a flashback, I, I think. So I, I think that's my, what my stance on that is. How about you, Andrew? Oh, no real stance. I just this came and went for me. Really, <laughs> it's just I already had knew those stuff about them. I don't know. I didn't. I had Ava, and yeah. No, no. Didn't add didn't add anything to me because probably much better to have the other two because they're more known yeah. and understood and present. Yeah. Well, it's not that like Kate, you're getting the Kenny and or Jane flashback instead of the Ava flashback. You get both flashbacks. Oh, yeah, I didn't get anything. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah it yeah. transitions to one month later after the Kenny yeah. flashback to the Ava flashback. In that case, Andrew, let me ask you this again as a as a GM. When you're making your, when you're designing your sessions or you're designing your story, um, sometimes 
players at the tabletop end up making choices that may, again, I'm, I'm not sure if you've, you probably have felt this, may have locked them out of content mm. that you might have prepared. It says, oh, if they oh, do yeah. this, then you get to do this really cool thing. But because they made this choice, then they can't do that thing anymore. or This doesn't happen. So do you try to compensate that by coming up with equally good or equally long content to compensate for the fact or do they end up getting quote unquote punished because they made the wrong choice that ended up giving them less content and cooler stuff that you prepared mm. i feel the only real what what makes the the tabletop gaming experience to me different than regular games uh or video games or war games or whatever is that it, it's a unique experience every time and mm -hmm. if it isn't then i don't i think it loses the, the the point of the game and the mentality that this is about your choices that you make for real and the beauty of that which which i did think towards the end of this episode of like if this is a tabletop game <laughs> so different like so many other ways yes. you can handle this instead of yes you get two bats you get two bats you get two bats mm -hmm. um yes so there are certainly times when I'm frustrated with some campaigns where I've planned out like, uh, like here's a, here's a region you can go help different parts of the region. They helped one thing out of six and then left the region. Uh, uh, <laughs> all this time to yes. to go in here, but the story has to be theirs. And if it's not theirs, then yeah, you know, if if I'm forcing the story, they, then I'm not doing it right. So you kind of have to sacrifice it and then either for some things you can kind of move them ahead, reskin them, reflavor them. Mm -hmm, so you can mm -hmm. kind of use right. the cool ideas elsewhere. Correct. But if they miss out on something, then they this is how your story goes this time. And the yeah. only time, maybe I'll run it with a different group, but that's their story entirely. Yeah. Uh, and I like the idea that you can do it a lot of different ways, but you can you can fail if there's if you can't fail then i find there's no real fail or or do it your own way then i don't really see much of the satisfaction with the experience yeah can kind of misses out on that i'm glad you answered that question because for me i i try to compensate but it can be really hard because um especially if the characters do something you completely didn't see coming and which puts them in you know region Y, which, well, I didn't even make a region Y. I guess I'm making a region Y now, or at least this region Y was mentioned, but you never thought they would ever go to said region, but they did. So now you're like, okay, now I have to add content to this region now. So yeah, I, because otherwise the alternative is, well, guys, I didn't really prepare anything. So uh, we're going to cut our session three hours short so I can come up with something. So yeah. <laughs> it's not easy, but it's, it's much better than sit there, shut up, listen to my story. Uh, yeah. Your, your captive audience, what you say. If you're going to allow choice and freedom, then you got to allow for bad choices. This is, you know, you could talk about, you know, why does God give us free will kind of thing? Well, I mean, you got to account for that too. You know, you're playing yeah. God. Sometimes yeah. your, your, your children are going to do something very stupid. And you know what? Yeah. You know, still got to go with it. Gotcha. Uh, if for I, me, uh, go ahead. Go ahead. It was something I should have mentioned this back when I was talking about the Kenny flashback. I just, but I just thought of it. They actually give an explanation as to why they were driving to Florida in the first flashback. Like the, apparently, oh, for okay. the past few years, they were camping out somewhere near Wellington. And Kenny says, "There's no, it's no use surviving out up here, hoping that they'll take us in someday." Implying that they've gone back to them, like they said. And they still kept on turning them down. So I guess Kenny was like, bugger it. Let's just go to Florida where I was born. I'm glad that they were able to add a little bit more detail to that then. I had no idea that that was there. Uh, for me, I would have preferred um, trying to give every player uh, some sort of five-minute content. And it doesn't even have to be in the form of a flashback. So if you ended up being alone and or 
was in Wellington, then maybe have some sort of five minute conversation with Javier that Clementine and Javier would not have had. I don't know. Otherwise, some people might be like, oh, well, that's not fair because you know, then we don't, we miss out on that content. I says, well, you miss out on the content with, with Jane or with Kenny if you didn't choose them. So it sort of balances out. Or another option is um, if you didn't want to have a, a flashback at Wellington for whatever reason, because I thought, I think Wellington, it would be interesting, like Mark said, if we had a little bit more um, information on what that place was like, maybe a little bit more about the relationship between Clementine and that I forgot the woman's yeah, name, but Edith. the woman Edith. Maybe maybe having some sort of established five minute relationship thing with Clementine and Edith. So at least Edith wasn't just a character that's there so she can get shot in episode one. That would have been really nice. Um, or, and I understand completely as soon as people hear my explanation that this is a very partial partial thing. But I think that it also would be cool if you were either in Wellington or if you were alone that you could get a flashback with Luke <laughs> from before, back in season two, before what happens to Luke happens to Luke, which I'm not going to talk about because I'm trying to forget about that. But um, what would the I think it would be really be, neat. Though? I'm sorry? What would the flashback be, though? It doesn't, I mean, it can be something as mundane as the period conversation that Javier and, and Clementine had. Like, I, I think it would be really neat for the people who actually liked Luke, because there was a lot of people who liked Luke, which is why I'm shocked that they couldn't bring him back, because Scott Porter is doing everything under the sun at Telltale nowadays. Um, they could have eased, I think they could have easily had him, you know, have a five-minute scene with Clementine and have them talk about whatever, like something about friends, family, which is basically what the theme of of Jane's and Kenny's was kind of about in their scenes. So um, I still think it was so odd that it was either Jane or Kenny instead of Luke or Kenny because they sp spent so much time building up the tension between Luke and Kenny, but then but then it turned out to be a red herring because Luke just dies out of nowhere midway through the finale, and they're like, "Oh, here we go! Now Kenny's fighting with Jane." Yeah, that's. That's a beaten horse for me. <laughs> That's a, I don't want to get into that because it's just going to make me more upset than I already am. So, but yeah, no, the, your, your sentiment is shared by a lot of people. Um, okay, so let's move on. Um, then after the, we have the scene with Ava, so you get a little bit more information about Ava and Clementine's relationship, uh, which surprised me a lot because I, didn't, I pegged Ava as being a lot shadier than she actually ended up being. So it was a pleasant surprise to see her character developed more, which I guess um, makes the decision a little bit more uh, meaningful when you get to the ending. Um, but we end up talking to the doctor, and he asks you to basically assist putting him down. Um, and in return, he would tell you about where AJ actually is, or who actually has AJ uh, was that a difficult decision for you guys, or did you have a rel was it relatively easy for you to make that decision? Uh, I took no part in assisting his suicide. It's like if you want to, I mean, I wish you the best of luck, but I'm not going to help you take your own life. If you want to, that's your choice, but just leave me out of it. I don't care if you're going to tell me where AJ is. Knowing Telltale, we're probably going to find out where AJ is, anyways. <laughs> So, oh, well, to be then to be completely honest, were you thinking that as a player, they're going to probably tell us where AJ is anyway, or? Yeah, that's basically what I was thinking. Okay. So I refused okay. to help. Gotcha. Which, um, by design-wise, it was a good choice because it was like split 50-50. Mm -hmm. Plus you had a hidden third option where if you let the timer go out, Clementine will decide his fate. Oh, does she then end up killing him? Yeah, she kills him. Got it. I kind of saw that. Uh, Andrew or Mark, did you guys have any difficulty with that? Or you you were like, yeah, I know what to do here. Oh, well, here's the thing with that. So so I, I, I would say in real life, that would be, you know, that's a very political question, as we all know, assisted suicide and all that. It's very controversial. So I'm, in a way, I'm actually kind of surprised that they, they put it 
in this game, but maybe I shouldn't because it's the walking dead and it's like anything goes. What I did, I, I, I actually did assist with his, with Dr. Lingard's suicide mm-hmm. for, for, for a couple of reasons. One, yes, he, he does tell you if you do do it, he does tell you where AJ is, but, but also it's like, you know, he, he did have a point. It's like, he was miserable. He, he knew what was going down um, at Richmond with the new frontier. Mm-hmm. It's like, he just did, wanted no part of that. And, and it, he just did not have the strength to do it himself. And it's like, well, okay, I'll do it for you. So, and that's what I did. So how easy of a decision was it for you? I, I would say, it, it. see, this is going to sound awful, but it was an easy decision to make. Okay. Even, but, but that's just for, you know, the game, not, I wouldn't do, I don't, in real life, I don't know what I would do. It, is it easy because, because you were going to find out where AJ was, was, uh, gonna be or because clementine really wanted you to do it yeah pretty pretty much clementine was okay. you know the deciding factor i would say yes okay and andrew uh, i i enabled him this was the first i mean that i noticed in this episode at least of uh where a tabletop game could have just done so much more uh in the situation uh I probably I would have okay yeah of course uh, like part of me says I got to know where AJ is as a like to help Clem to just help me as a player cuz little kid uh to even help Javi in s- some respect too of like this is really important but the the you can kill him or not like I, I already thought well well I'll just kind of put it in his arm and I'll distract him over here and I'll do like a third of what he wants. And then yeah, after you get these things, like all these in between options, uh, that one really, I didn't care about the guy very much anyway. Um, so it didn't bother me to, to do it, but it bothered me more as a game choice standpoint than the, the scene itself and kind of gotten the hint of, I, I probably wouldn't have done it following how I've been role playing Javier as much as I can of don't give up. We always got to keep fighting. There's always hope, mm-hmm. uh, stay positive kind of thing. But if it goes to the point of, I thought it was AJ's, you know, threatened somehow, mm-hmm. then, mm-hmm. then we need to get this info, but I would have, you know, get the info and then, yeah, no, I'm just kidding or it's, fake it. So it's, it's so go ahead. Uh, he was suspiciously shady because but he begins the conversation of just going, so that's what this is about, then you want to know where the kid is? I'm just like, why else would she be here? Mm-hmm. I did think his talk about his relationship with David did make Dr. Lingard a more interesting character to me. I don't know how anybody else feels, but sorry to interrupt. What I was going to ask Andrew was, um, so... If 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 you were handling this scene in a tabletop setting, you're saying that uh, you probably would have provided more options than just kill this guy or not kill this guy. Is that what I'm hearing? That comes in the base design of the scene. That that when you're kind of planning it initially, like if I'm just going to go sketch out Walking Dead season three episode four of yeah. my campaign, I would probably mm-hmm. you know want to clue like what do they do with Lingard. And I would say, okay, well, here's going to be the the difficult moral choice um, as on a base level is kill him or not. But then that's the initial planning. Then you come back around and say, can I add more nuance to this? Can we, um, and you try and expect, what are my players going to do? I know them a little bit by this point. What are they likely to to choose? And they're likely to not choose either of those. They want to go, you know, they, they want the, they want to get both, right? Yes. They don't want to lose anything. Uh, is yes. a very common player mentality. Yes. So to to not have come back or to just decide, you know, maybe this is how Walking Dead does or programming issues or whatever. Um, for me, in most situations, yeah, it'd probably quadruple their budget and the time that things are released. But four choices are is like where I would have gone for each kind of option. And I guess in yeah. this one we had three, but not really a third thing happens. 
but you're kind of really limited and i get why that is but it wouldn't be kind of my approach but yeah. it's just very different kind of medium what what you just said actually actually hits very close to home for me because with the finale of my dragon age season two campaign coming to a close when you were saying the characters always want to f have everything <laughs> the players want to have everything they don't want to just have to settle for a versus b um the finale comes with a major choice for the characters and i gave them f five I, I introduced to them five choices none of the five choices are all that great to be honest and i designed them specifically to be all that great and uh because I wanted it to be a, a tough choice. I wanted them to actually not say, oh, this one's obviously better than the other four. Um, they came up with a sixth choice, which also isn't that great either. Um, and uh, it's, it's not me as a GM trying to be cruel. Like, it's just, I, I was just curious, like, if you're given a situation where there are no good choices, what would you end up doing? Or, or it's not even... For me, as a GM who's observing this, it's not even so much what the choice is, it's like how, what was the mentality, what was the reasoning behind why you made that choice? What led you to that choice? Which I also find interesting. Maybe that is like, maybe that is um, kind of, I guess, uh, what is it, uh, masochistic of me, I guess, or I don't know. <laughs> um, cool, cool. Okay, then, we come to the Kate and Javier talk about where they're at. Oh, yes. Do you want to start with this, Andrew? <laughs> so dumb. I even, I even drew it in my notes. Um, I have like these, these arcing branches. And yes, yes. You're talking, of course, he's going to feel some, some connection to her. Of course, there's going to be weird moments. It doesn't, the, the result of that conversation to me it would have been yeah I, I i do have feelings for you of course i do but it's muddled and all this other stuff going on and you know we now david's in the picture so i'm struggling with the idea of you know being a good brother or not and you know all this came like i absolutely do have them but i'm trying to figure out what that really means uh would have been my response instead it's let's make out now or i reject you completely or i didn't mm -hmm. click the rejection because i'm like mm -hmm. I only have two choices here. I guess mm -hmm. I could have not said anything. I guess I don't mm -hmm. realize that that's a choice too. Uh, <laughs> but open, open thro frothy romance or hard <laughs> rejection were kind of like <laughs> uh, neither of them made any sense to me and yeah. took away all nuance and subtle like s subtlety to their relationship that kind of just made them yeah, not the whole character, but that aspect to them. Yeah. Yeah. There's, there should have been a third option. Yeah. It's complicated. Can we talk about it another time? You know, before <laughs> my yes. brother about to get hung and we're trapped we're yeah. by zombies and yeah. Yeah. That was my, re my reaction to it. How, how about Mark or Jacob? What are your reactions to that scene? You, you know, I that rejected her. I'm sorry. Was I the only one that rejected her feelings? Oh no, but I think Mark probably did not reject her. Is my guess. Is my I guess. I did not reject her. Okay, okay. Well, let's start with Mark. I mean, let's start with Jacob first. Um, do you have any thoughts or reaction to that scene? I did think it was interesting how they added in a nice little detail of if you chose to kiss Kate in episode one, but then rejected her in this episode. Yeah. They added in this yeah. scene for slapping you. Yeah. So I'm just like. <sighs> Understandably so. Um. I just looked at that. I'm like, I get that hot. It was just you, you two and the kids for four years in the apocalypse on your own. I get that you two probably would have gotten intimate as a source for human comfort. But at the same time, you're still my brother's wife. I have boundaries. Even if David were probably dead, I still probably wouldn't want uh, to get into a relationship. Because at that point, then the kids would have to watch their stepmom hook up with their uncle. I mean, we can still be friends, but just no, please. Mark, as somebody who who did not reject Kate, you, what is your thoughts and reaction? Okay, well, well, first of all, um, 
I, I find it, I think it's really interesting what Andrew said. Like, it may actually makes me look at the scene in a whole different light because it's like, yeah, it's actually really inappropriate that we're having this conversation right before David's about to be hung and you were his wife and we're having mm -hmm. this conversation. Now it's like, yeah, that conversation was really inappropriate, but it happened. So here, 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 what my thoughts are. Um, so yeah, so if you remember all the way back to episode one, I did kiss Kate, because, and I did give my reasoning as that they did spend four years together. You know, they obviously have feelings for each other, and it's like, and I already pretty, I already pretty much committed to Kate with that kiss in episode one. It's yeah. like, so okay, yes, I, I'll, I'll, you know, yes, I, I will commit. So, so that's pretty much, yeah, that's that's what happened because yeah. you know you want that you want you want to have something to live for like that yeah. so i don't i don't at all judge or think that anyone who decided to pursue a relationship to kate i don't necessarily you know think that they're wrong in doing that because given the situation that they're at especially since they you know they f thought that david was dead and then we find out that david was probably not a very good husband for her if he was as abusive as you know the game has been implying um I can understand that such a relationship can form between those two characters. Totally, totally get that. What I don't like is that one thing that this particular uh, Telltale Games does badly that Bioware games do well is that in Bioware games, romances are always optional. Like they do very well about saying we have this romance here, but if you don't want to do any, if you don't want to romance any of the characters, that's okay. Um, and they do a good job of staying true to that. There are characters, and people make have opinions of this, there are characters in the Bioware games who do make the first move, who might start hitting on you, but there's an option to reject them and say, you know, oh, I'm flattered, but I'm not really interested in that way. And then once you reject them, it's done. Like, they don't continue pursuing you. Here... I've been rejecting Kate left and right, and she's still like throwing herself at me. And it's annoying because it really makes me feel like I am going against what the writers are intending. They are railroading me to actually have feelings for Kate in a way that's beyond platonic. Because I think having a platonic, Kate, platonic interest in Kate is also believable. Um, so I don't like how they are punishing me by making me feel bad because I keep not trying to not lead Kate along. She keeps throwing herself at me. And every time I reject her three, four, five, six times, she gets all upset and pouty and I'm sick of it. <laughs> it's like annoying. And then finally we have this whole, you know, conversation where she wants to know, okay, where do we stand? And I'm thinking, did you not get the hint the six other times that I, re that I, that I it's like, dropped you like a whatever and again i like kate as a person i like her as a character i really do but i felt like the writers did not do her character justice because it seemed like her main purpose in this story was just to be a love interest for our pro protagonist mm -hmm. like that's all she is it seems she's not really a, a biological mother of gabe and Moira, you know, she, yes, she happens to be the wife of your brother, but other than that, it just seems, I just feel like the writers did not, did a disservice to her character. They didn't do her character enough justice because it seems like that was her purpose. And if she wasn't fulfilling that purpose, the game was going to punish you for it. Mm. And so that's my biggest rant on the whole Kate and, and whatever thing. And if you wanted to, if you wanted to pursue a relationship with Kate, great. It looks like the people who wanted that got that, and hopefully it was executed in a way that was satisfying for them. But make it an option. Make it an option, I guess, is, is my biggest problem. Well, I guess they so. wanted to wait till episode four to make it an option. <laughs> yeah. I guess so. me and Harker and the 17.7% .7 of players <laughs> who rejected her. Yeah. I mean, I guess, I guess you could say, well, I'm in the minority, therefore, you know... I guess my, my opinion doesn't matter as much because I'm in the minority, but... Is it fair to say that it's more of a now. character problem with Kate than it is a writing problem? Because you could yeah. probably make your argument... Yeah. 
and Cage just really in love. I guess you can I guess you can pinpoint that as more of a writing problem because it's a video game and not a movie. Yeah. They did the exact same thing, really, although I, I don't think it was nearly as bad with Carly in season one. Because they definitely were, were, I wouldn't say shoving. Kate was more of a shove. This was more of a nudge, trying to get Lee to have some sort of a romantic relationship with Carly. And I love Carly, too. She's a sweet character. I really liked her character. Um, I could have seen myself, if it wasn't for the fact that I had to choose between her and Doug, I could have seen my, myself, you know, possibly pursuing a relationship with her, but, you know, make it optional, <laughs> I think, I mean, was, was the, the problem. With the Carly romance, with no payoff, because they set it up only to have her die five minutes later. Correct. Yeah. Um, anyway. Uh, okay, I think, we've, I think we've shared our thoughts with that. <laughs> so, now, let's... Let ships, Clementine and Gabe... Oh, I think it's kind of. You... I just think it's kind of adorable, but that's just me. Probably How about Mark? Or... Yeah, Gabe's a very unpopular character in this season. Like almost everyone hates him. Kind of like Ben in season one. <laughs> and if there's a choice to keep him alive or not in the next episode, I'm probably going to be the only person that saves him. I I personally really like Gabe a lot. I don't know what Mark's or Andrew's opinion of him is. I guess that that is a good twofold question. Like first. What are your thoughts on Gabe just in general? And second, what are your thoughts on him and Clementine possibly becoming more than just friends? Okay, um, so my thoughts on Gabe in general. So so in the first three episodes, um, yeah, he, he was being moody, but it's like all teenagers are moody at their age. So it's like, and me being his uncle, it's like, okay, I have to understand where he's coming from. And it's like, I have to be there and it's like, try to support him. It's like, so, and I know it can be, you know, it's, it's annoying. And I, and I get that, you know, uh, you know, people might be turned off. Um, what really upset me in this episode in particular was that, um, you know, I, and I, cause Gabe wanted to like really, really help out. And I understand that, but, um, but, you know, it's like I was just trying to protect him. And then because I killed Conrad in episode two, he threw me under the bus. And I did not appreciate that at all. <laughs> like, I was really angry at him um, when he did that. Um, because, Especially because, did, did you forget that Conrad uh, held you hostage? He had a gun to your head? Yeah, very, yeah, good point. So I, I really, uh, I did not appreciate that Um so I was very, very, so, you know, nephew or not, I was really turned off by, by, by that. So I was kind of like really upset with Gabe for the rest of the episode. Um, but, you know, but it's like, again, I'm his uncle and it's like, yeah, it was the heat of the moment. So I tried to make amends. So I, I guess that's what, what my thoughts on Gabe as a whole. Now, as for the, the Clementine and Gabe relationship, I guess you could say this episode is the shipping episode because that's what Telltale wants to do. <laughs> Um, I mean, it could work. It, it could. I'm not opposed to it, but it's like, it's like, it's just like you have the one teenage girl and the one teenage boy. It's like romance. It's like, it feels kind of forced, but you know, anything's possible, I guess. There's the question of you, would Clementine want to pursue a relationship with her survivor's guilt? Hmm. True. Do you, I guess, I guess, I guess. My question is: Do you think it would be a good thing for Clementine to pursue something romantic with Gabe, or do you think ultimately that's a bad thing? Depends on how it's executed. Mark, how yeah, about you? I, I would have to agree. I mean, that that's up to her. It's what what she's feeling. You know? Okay. It's like, how about you? She has to follow her heart. Andrew, thoughts on Gabe as a character in general, and thoughts on the relationship. So I. I was a, a substitute teacher for one week in a middle school and mm -hmm. I will not be a substitute teacher for middle <laughs> schoolers ever again. And it's not their fault, right? It, it, it is, you are responsible for your actions, but you got a lot going against you. So I feel like from an outsider's perspective, a gamer sitting with the controller, of course, Gabe sucks. He's, he's terrible. <laughs> um, but if you're role playing, then Javier is his, he's his dad. I mean, he, not biologically, but 
you you are what you do uh, in so many capacities, especially when it comes to that relationship that I'm trying to see it from his point of view. And I was equally put off and uh, it didn't make any sense or connect the dots for me that Gabe would. And maybe there isn't a situation where he doesn't. I don't know. Um, but because we were we were palling it up at the post office and getting the guns and I was being encouraging and, and trying to you know give him more responsibility. And I was just like, I, I tried to there's there's an option like right before he says it about where'd you get your your cut? And I, I picked to like, oh, it's nothing. Don't worry about it. And still Gabe blurted out, like, I was covering for you, dude. I'm giving you the chance to be responsible. Yeah. And, mm-hmm. and yeah, you yeah. screwed up, but that's okay. Mm-hmm. You know, we got out of it. All right. It's, there's way worse going on in the world today, you know, than, mm-hmm. you know, a scratch. And to have him do that was just yeah. a kind of a forced, well, sitting in the writer's room or, or as a, we mentioned before, there is no writer's room. There's like, 30 different people all doing their own little thing to this um, mm-hmm. that it felt really uh, like just someone asked to say it let's make it Gabe because no one likes Gabe anyway kind yeah. of a thing uh, I didn't think that played out very well yeah. uh, and then the romance again is timing guys timing like wouldn't you be worried that your dad is about to get hung and their whole plan didn't make any sense to me like what was the point of the truck I thought like the way dialogue I was choosing was we need to stay here. We can make this work. We just have to overthrow the corruption. We're going to get the crowd on our side. Mm-hmm. And the point of the truck was uh, they were going to, someone was going to be in the, stay in the background. And then once they were able to free David, they would all board in the truck and leave Richmond. And the truck would allow them to escape fastly and bypass the herd. Cause they could just plow through the walkers. I must've missed that. Cause I thought there, I had picked dialogue options that were saying we, we can't keep running you know we got to we can make this work you just need to do something about it i didn't get that it kind of felt to me like well we haven't had a zombie scene thing so eleanor was the one that was pushing to stay because she's like they like me so that's got to count for something and then trips like just because they like you doesn't mean they'll like the rest of us and i'm just thinking yeah "Yeah." the clarifying part i'll just kind of a slight aside is i think i would have been better served Maybe this was my role in this panel was to be like mostly ignorant or forgetful. Maybe I'm just an old man, but like it would have been great to play it all or have played the other three and or play multiple playthroughs. Uh, I feel like I'm missing some of the experience because I didn't do that. So maybe mm-hmm. it's helpful to have that perspective, but very much um, valuing Jacob's you know input on like all these other things. So I wanted to make sure that that was pointed out that. Either I'm just forgetful or it's just been too long or it's just wasn't there enough. Mm-hmm. Like, I feel like, am I forgetting something that should have happened to make this scene make more sense? And maybe yes, but maybe sometimes it's just not uh, as well crafted. So Gabe and um, Clem, sure, it's cute, makes sense. <laughs> yeah, come on, it's timing, good. guys, timing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I know. felt a little forced. I know that... Um... When I'm when I'm live streaming, uh, a good number of people in the chats uh, have said that Cl- Gabe's not good enough for Clementine, um, and that's probably true. Um, I I think that that in general, uh, I think that um, especially with their Walking Dead uh, games lately, Telltale has not done a very good job. I'll even say they've been doing a poor job of consistency with their characters. And I think we've mentioned that several times in this particular Let's Talk, um, where uh, no, it seems that no, no matter how often the words so-and-so will remember that, they don't seem to really remember that. It doesn't seem that actually, are you sure they're actually remembering that? Because they seem to forget a lot later on. <laughs> So I think that um, Telltale needs to do a better job with that because I feel like they did an okay job with that with David. I guess if you made all the right choices, you can earn David's loyalty, even though he ends up doing what he ends up doing at the end of the game regardless. But um, yeah, I think with Gabe, they they dropped the ball on that as well in that they sh- you should see a natural progression of his relationship with Javier if you 
pick specific responses. And I think that we are not seeing that enough and it ends up being um, disjointed as a, as a result. So, all right, now we finally get to the very end where everything hits the fan. Before everything hits the fan, you know, we have, we have the town hall meeting or whatever, Joan's up there giving her Professor Umbridge speech. And, um, and uh, then they, you get to see, I guess, the result of your decisions of who you've killed or not killed because they line up all the bodies. And depending on who you've killed over the course of the last four episodes, you get to see, you know, the corpses up there. Um, and then Joan forces you eventually to choose between Ava and Trip. And I guess the, the twist in this particular instance is whoever you, you picked, that's the person who doesn't get executed. Um, which I think is something that Telltale hasn't done yet. Your thoughts on that scene and t leading up to just before David does what David's going to do. <laughs> yeah. I wanted uh, uh, to apologize for interrupting people. Sometimes the audio cuts out and it sounds like he's done. people are done talking. Um, I thought it was, I really liked this choice. I remember back in season two, after the uh, episode two just ended, I was having a conversation with a buddy of mine. I said, it would be really interesting if they had a choice where Carver has both Kenny and Luke tied up and he asks you to pick one to save. And the one that you choose to save is the one he ends up executing. But that never happened, and now to see it here, I'm actually kind of uh, surprised. And I was, um, and I ended up picking Trip just because we had been uh, through the, uh, the been been together for so much longer than Ava. Regardless of whether or not uh, that flashback we had with Ava really made the decision harder, because had we not had that, I would have been like Trip all the way, because I barely know Ava. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. Yes. We did basically get two Carly Doug choices right, like in a row straight after each other, but we'll talk about that one later. Uh, uh -huh. uh, um, but I did think this was an interesting choice because now in the next episode we're going to have, I guess we can tell Trip or Ava a, a reverse psychology trip. Oh, I knew Joan would uh, not execute you because I didn't <laughs> save you. <laughs> yeah, that, that might be an interesting like choice if they actually include that uh mark or andrew so yeah I, I actually really really like this choice as well because and this it's not just in the walking dead games but pretty much in most telltale games that have an m rating um you, you pretty much have to choose you know between two people um so the fact that whoever you pick actually is the one who ends up dying, flip that choice on its head. It's like, it's something, you know, it subverts your expectations. It's, I, I didn't certainly didn't see that coming. And I mean, I knew, you know, Joan was a, a slimy person, you know, who couldn't be trusted, but like, even that it's like, I didn't really see coming. Uh, and, and I also wanted to add, it's like, because you make that choice, in a way, technically, nobody can get mad at you because you were forced into that situation. And so, and if you like pick trip, like if you try to save Trip, Eleanor can't be mad at you because you tried to save Trip, and then David and Ava can't be mad at you because Ava ended up living. So nobody can get mad at you at that choice. And uh, and if you're curious about who I picked, it was Trip for for pretty much the same reasons. You know, we we've been through the ringer. You know, we've had had um, this history as short as it might have been. But so that's who I tried to save. Andrew. So one small part of me likes the idea of certainly flipping the the choice. The rest of it thought this didn't make any sense um, from multiple characters' perspectives as to why they're making the choices that they're making, why they're in this situation, uh, and maybe just building off of the previous one. But I thought I there's so many other ways that I would have approached this scene if I was playing Javier and had didn't have programming. Um, and maybe that's not not a fair criticism because this is not that. But it just kind of resonated with me. Like this, there's moments when you are really making a big impact on the story, and mm -hmm. that's really cool. Like this, what you're doing matters. But then there's the moments where it's like 
I get that this matters for sure, but it seems kind of just so narrow and limited. The first time I got in this scene, I didn't choose. I'm like, where's the option to, to talk to this situation more? Um, where's the option to, I thought the plan was to come here and expose Joan as a criminal and you haven't done anything. You like walked up to the stage. No, he did nothing. Like he was not convincing in any respect <laughs> at all. I'm like, I thought that was the battle plan. And then just while I'm thinking of it, the reasoning to, to save trip was so dumb. I was, I, I, I almost closed the game to re restart it of, oh, trip well he's 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 useful to me it's handy to have him like <laughs> where's the option to i ref, like i guess you have the option to refuse but then it's game over okay. yeah which which is i let that play out um but isn't there an option to refuse turn around to the crowd and say is this is the leader i mean this is the person she's gonna murder people yeah. in front of you for this yeah. and I yeah. could even see the, I know it wouldn't, but if I was playing Javier in a, a tabletop game, mm -hmm. being okay with him getting shot right then and there for taking a stand and that stand being the match that lights the fire that, that turns the revolution that overthrows this, I could yep. be okay with that, but they can't do that for this, I guess. Um, uh, then the, yeah, so the scene is, is wonky and Joan seems really mustache twirling villain she was kind of subtle before and about you know mm. control and really valuing the old now she's just kind of being malicious and uh sinister and cruel for no like this seems like a bad political idea if you're going to be smart and savvy you're just going to execute people on stage for nothing and yeah it, it just seemed like she's dumber than she should have been and javier's dumber than he should have been and there's no options here that are really great and the last thing is I wrote down in my notes, what's with all the neck shots? All the people getting shot in the neck, like you shoot them in the head. Isn't that the point to stop them from coming back? Yeah, exactly. But everyone's yes. getting hit in the neck, trip, point blank, in the neck. All the people you walk around and shoot at the tear gas, neck shots, all of them. It was very weird. I don't know if anyone else <laughs> noticed that. Interesting. I did not notice that. That's interesting you point that out. Um, Clearly, what Joan did was a dirty trick in character. Out of character, looking from a game design perspective, did you find that choice, they'll, they'll execute the opposite of what you say. Do you find that as a negative, dirty trick that they played on the player? Or do you find that as a positive or at least interesting, oh, Telltale tried to give you a surprise or a twist? Do you, do you see that as a negative or positive thing that they did from a game design or writing pers perspective? Oh, that's hard to say. Um, I guess in my position, it feels like it's it was a neat idea, but it wasn't well executed and uh, uh, and like it 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 was just too kind of surface level for me because I've. It didn't feel in line with her character. So it was like, here's an idea. And the whole scene was kind of a mess for me. But here's an idea. It's a neat idea. But they put it in that situation. And that felt a little too inconsistent, again, with what we've seen or what I saw anyway. Um, that that was my response. But I get it's, it's a neat game mechanic. It's going to piss off people. It's a great yeah. thing to do in the fourth episode of something when there's five. I mean, that's mm -hmm. so, yeah. It, I give it a begrudging. Yeah, that's a good idea. Have you have you ever done that before, Andrew? Where in a tabletop setting, where you give the players a choice, oh, and then oh, yes. and and as a villain, they do the opposite of the choice. And um, how do you handle that? Because I'm sure, like you said, some of the players might be peed off out of character that you did that. But also, you could say, well, he's the villain. Villains lie, and their their purpose is to mm. have you hate them. And don't you hate them? Well, see, then it worked. <laughs> it's, I would put it in the gimmicky column of making you hate the villain. Um, Unless it's been established already that they're extremely unpredictable. Like the Joker, I would say yeah. he would be a great person to do this because it's in right. his character to, to not listen to you. He doesn't have a code of honor. He doesn't have a code of anything. You know, he's just, yeah. you do, like, that's what he did in the Dark Knight, right? He flipped it yeah. and told him the opposite. So mm -hmm. that would be to me like fitting the character. Mm -hmm. uh, 
and you've learned it in smaller degrees. So mm-hmm. if you get into this situation, you have at least, I would say, maybe like a 25% chance to realize this might be happening. Not obvious, but there's been hints throughout leading up that they might be turn this around, that they might twist, that they can't, you can't rely on their actions. Um, I don't feel that was established with Joan. Not enough for me. But yeah, okay. I, I've done a whole game. Oh, I we won't get too long into it, but a whole game where they thought they were working in one direction and it was in fact the opposite, the whole thing. They didn't like that, but I thought it was cool. So it was a one shot though. So actually you played in part. Of, oh, I shouldn't say anything. Whoops. I forgot that we had done that a little bit. <laughs> uh, Mark or Jacob, did you have anything else to say about that before we move on to the to the firing? <laughs> okay, so so then, at least for me, what happens, and I don't think I saw what happens um, with the other with the other way, but I I tried to I tried to be as diplomatic as possible. I tried to sway the crowd to see Joan for the true monster that she actually is. And it seemed like the crowd was, was, I mean, I had him like, that was the frustrating. I think Dave, uh, Andrew felt the same way. Like we had him, we had the crowd, the crowd was on our side and Clint, you know, was, was ready to like actually take a stand and go against Joan. And then David, as brilliant as he is, decides he's just gonna throw the entire thing out of the way, threaten Clint's life, shoot Clint, and things just go awry. Everything goes awry. Which I felt was just... I was more upset at that than I was with the whole, you know, choosing verse, with, with Trip versus Ava and having the opposite happen. Like, I was way more upset about that because it just seemed like, really? Like, is David really that... Stupid, and I think I think I think Andrew could be like, well, as Andrew said, well, we also seen that David is also very reckless, and he he doesn't think before he does things, and he's anger issues. But even then, I mean, even with that, that's a pretty idiotic, stupid shooting himself in the foot, shooting himself into both feet plus his limbs and his head, kind of kind of thing. I, I don't know how Mark and Jacob felt about that, or if they're. If in their game something completely different happened with that. I'm assuming that if if you decided to shoot I guess the choice was to shoot Joan or not. I'm assuming if you decided to shoot Joan, then the crowd is all automatically against you and things start going crazy after that. Yeah. It's it's just uh, another big choice because if you choose to take the deal, um David does end up killing Clint and Joan escapes. But if you choose to shoot Joan, Clint escapes, meaning depending on your choice, Clint or Joan will be the I guess main yeah. villain in the next episode. I yeah. I kind of under got where David was coming from because five minutes ago Clint was perfectly fine with allowing David to be hung and only changed his mind after Joan was like, "Let's execute some of Javier's friends." Mm-hmm. So uh, that was what David was talking about when he told Javier to shoot her. They're butchers, all of them, and then the choice pops up and he chooses to take the deal, and he's like, "I don't believe you. Take the deal and stuff it." I mean, yeah, he did ruin it for everyone, but I kind of got because of what Clint just flip flopping every. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe I'm just weird. Uh, anybody else feel no. differently? It's. A, I think that's a valid. That's a valid point in defense of David. How about How about you, Mark? Um. I. I mean. I. I guess. Yeah, I guess it makes sense. Like you know, especially um, if you remember in the in episode three, it, when you're walking with Kate to, well, for me it was walking to David's house. Um, she says, "This is what David lives for." You know, a battle, the thrill of war is like when he's re- truly you know alive. So, mm-hmm. so I, I guess you know, no matter what, it's like that's what he lives for. He lives for war. He lives for a conflict, and that's just who he is. So it's like the. So I guess it was inevitable that something was going to happen. Yeah, I, I'd ag- I'd end up agreeing that it's it's mostly in character. I guess I was just disappointed that the time spent between like our our investments. I guess investments don't pay off. It's true, but Javier with David kind of showing him, you know, I'm not for myself anymore. You know, we we don't do things for ourselves, and and 
you know, we, I'm, I'm standing by you. I'm sticking by you. Is kind of what I just kept reiterating in my playthrough that I'm not that same guy who was gambling and, and stuff all out for myself. And it felt like a very out for himself kind of action. <clears throat> so I, I, I guess, yeah, I, I guess I can be okay with the investment not paying off to try and change and you know alter David's personality a little bit. I get you know people don't change that quickly or whatever, but yeah. and it still felt like a really bonehead move. Like you're saying, in character bonehead, but that's even still kind of yeah. dumb. Like we had the situation pretty well, right? Yeah. Like, let me work on it a little bit more. Yeah, I think that if he was going to, you know, act out, he he could have waited to see if the situation was getting worse again, because it because it was on its way up. So like, even even with his anger issues, at least wait for it to start to dip again. Or see if it will dip again, because it could it could very well keep going up for all you know. But he didn't want to take that chance, I guess. Um, so, so yeah. So then, there's like all out war now. Conrad gets a really shining moment if you kept him alive, which is really neat. Um, and then uh, Kate comes in with the truck and ends up crashing, and that ends up being the major cliffhanger. Um, to catapult us into the final episode. I guess that if if David didn't end up acting out as the way he did, then you could argue, well, then we there wouldn't be any content for episode five. Like that is the con like this needs to happen, so episode five will happen. It's and it's it's almost like what Andrew and I were talking about earlier is, well, if you make the right decision, then that means uh, the players lose out on three hours of content because, they were able to wrap everything up in a nice little bow and, you know, let's, well, sorry guys, let's end our uh, session three hours earlier well, now can, because you guys solved the problem. <laughs> I can think of an extremely, maybe I'm the minority, extremely rewarding session five where you get to decide and kind of plan out where does Richmond go from here and establish yeah. new rules and new governance and maybe here's a, a new hope for yeah. Virginia yeah. and for people. I would, I would be like, that's awesome. I could. I would love that too. Yeah. But instead, uh, nope, gotta get the zombies in. When the truck hit the, yeah. the wall, I'm like, had to have from, the zombies in you. Or from, had from a to game. get in, didn't they? It also didn't help that a member of the New Frontier threw a Molotov on top of the car with leaking gasoline. Yeah, like, for, you, for added drama. Did you bring that to the rallies? Or like, yeah. Have yeah. that around? <laughs> yes. Um, but no, exactly what you're saying, um, Andrew. That's what would actually happen in a tabletop setting. And the unfortunate thing is, you know, to, to execute what you're saying essentially means the developers have to make an entirely new game, like an entirely new episode five, because there's the episode five where you didn't wrap things up in a tight bow, and then there's the episode five where you do, and then God forbid how the writers are going to end up handling that for season four, if they do a season four. And I, so yeah, there... The, the the limitations of what you can you can do with the video games with what the resources you have based on compared to tabletop gaming for example is quite clear and we've pointed that out in several ways today. Um, okay, so now that we've talked about the entire episode, what were your thoughts on this episode overall, but compared to the other f three episodes? I think this is the first time where Telltale made the penultimate episode the best episode of the season. Because a penultimate episode okay. has really been Telltale's weakness, something that's mm -hmm. been consistent across the majority of the games I've played, like Walking Dead Season 1, Walking Dead Season 2, Wolf Among Us. Uh, I don't really remember. Um, it's been a long time since I've played Borderlands, but I remember mm -hmm. it being okay. And then I think episode five of Game of Thrones is probably the weakest episode. So it's like, mm -hmm. it's always been consistent where somehow I always go myself, wow, is it just me or have all of their penultimate episodes been the weakest episodes of those seasons? But then they pull mm -hmm. it back up because usually I'm always going, the, the finale was always the best episode. Mm -hmm. But I did really like this episode because of all of the branching story arcs because um, a little detail um, you're, there's a quick time event to dodge the truck that Kate, when Kate is coming by at the end, and if Conrad is still alive, if you miss the quick time event, then he saves you oh. from the truck, 
and Kate oh. accidentally ends up running over him, and that's how he dies. Oh, wow. But, but if you hit the quick time event in time, Conrad goes on into episode five alive. But what if, well, what if you miss the quick time and Conrad wasn't there? Do you just die? I saw that on Swing Point's live stream. Clementine saves you. And Clementine stays alive. Okay. Yeah, Clement I think it would be, I think it would be in a much more yeah. interesting detail if Conrad wasn't there, then you just died and you'd have to start over. I think yeah. that would have been more interesting of a, of a design. But anyway. Yeah. So, cool. So Conrad can die. You have to keep Conrad alive in episode two, episode three, and episode four. Wow. And I hope that pays off in episode five. Because there are a couple of ideas. Yeah. There are a couple of ideas that can go with this because you can have Trip's reaction to Conrad's death if Kate ran over him. You can have Trip and Conrad interacting if you kept them both alive. Then you can also have Conrad reacting to Trip's death if Conrad was True. kept alive in all three episodes and Trip was executed. That's a good point. I do I do hope that they they explore that in episode five, if possible. Mark. Um, it, it's funny because pretty much Jacob said everything that I was going to say. Like, I do believe like usually the second to last episode of every Telltale game usually is the weakest episode. But this one was really strong. You know, overall, it was it was really strong. And um, and I can't wait to for tomorrow for the finale. Andrew. Uh, you're still mute, Andrew. Okay. okay. Yeah, I was I was sparing you the the, <laughs> the cute sounds. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> I think this. I I was conflicted throughout the episode, um, feeling the. Wow, this is. Wow, this is really awesome. And how many? I was thinking, how many different ways could this go? That's really neat. I I remember moments of that of like. Yeah, uh, I remember moments of I feel disadvantaged. Either my brain doesn't work right or I haven't replayed the stuff recently or remember it kind of fresh enough to build that up. And then I think because I was wowed by some things, it was the stark contrast it felt like in the moments that were just kind of shoved, felt like shoved in there, shoehorn, I guess the term, and just... Like really, this is you. All these other interesting ways things could go, and this is so narrow and plain and disappointing that mm -hmm. it kind of was a real contrasting experience for me of uh, kind of feelings. And I, so, yeah, I, I'm in it, but bittersweet, I guess, is not not because anything bad happening, just or things that I didn't want to happen, just great moments and then really poorly executed moments was my experience compared to the other three how would you rate this one um i guess it, it had a lot of going on and i think you're starting to see the fruition the, the fruits of the branching paths is really making a difference on some things and then makes no difference whatsoever it seems on others um and i get that too like i guess i'm just thinking more designer in, mm -hmm. in the story writer because i've been doing a lot of that that it's really hard i don't i don't blame them like for not making a totally a sec a different episode five i think it could be something you could stand on for the rest of your career as we went there we we didn't you know we did this really amazing thing that hasn't been done and yet yeah, cost mm -hmm. us a bunch but wow we are proud of that mm -hmm. uh, could have done that but yeah maybe they do in some of the other Telltale games, I don't know, um, but yeah, I'm 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 game for five, I guess. I, I want to see where this ends. They they kind of did do that a little bit in um, in Minecraft actually, where if you make a specific decision at the end of one episode and at the second episode, like the entire thirty to forty five minutes is completely different. Um, so I think they. I think Telltale was trying to do something along those lines. So, but that, but then, but then again, at the same time, that specific episode as a whole was shorter 
than the other episodes because I guess they needed to spend the resources to make those extremely like extremely branching beginning of of that episode therefore the entire episode as a whole was shorter yeah so episode two of minecraft was like not even not even an hour it was like 55 minutes yeah yeah as a result of that so it'd be cool if you could still have a full-on episode despite that um maybe maybe Later, Telltale might be able to do that. Well, Telltale has have more resources. to episode five as the most branching episode of The Walking Dead so far. Huh. Okay. Well, we'll see, I guess. I don't know if anyone's watched the trailer that Telltale put out, but I I, I think it's... I don't, if you guys don't want to discuss this, that's fine, but I think Telltale is really good about not spoiling stuff when it comes to trailers. They just give you little hints of what to come because they just replace the little next time stuff that they got rid of for this season. But based on the trailer, the flashback for episode five is going to be David and Javi talking to their deceased father from the cold opening of the first episode. Hmm. And there are some lines hinting that uh, of David at tackling Javi to the ground and looks like nearly about to kill him, saying this is what now you're going to finally know what blood means. And I'm just thinking that's probably a determinate scene because I'm on good graces with David because I didn't ditch him in episode three and I backed off of Kate. So I'm thinking if that is determinate, that's going to be cool based on your the relationship with David. If it's so bad that you're like brothers or that you end up killing each other. Mm -hmm. Any other final thoughts before we close? Okay. Well, everybody who's watching, thank you very much for hanging out with us. Hopefully, as usual, you found something interesting um, or maybe even learned a thing or two. And we will see you guys one more time when we talk about the finale. Make, uh, make sure to comment if you have a view on the, the period scene, because yeah. a feminine perspective of that, because we're supremely limited in that approach. Yes, I totally, I too, I totally agree with Andrew on that. Uh, I definitely, would love, definitely would love to get uh, a, a more diverse perspective. Um, or anything really, anything at all that you found us talking about, if it sparks some sort of profound thoughts or reactions, please don't be shy about putting them down in the comments because I'm sure we would love hearing from you. So thank you guys so much for watching and until next time, love yourselves and love each other and happy gaming. <laughs>